Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Planting Your Rain Garden with Melinda Myers. We are just going to give everyone a couple minutes here to uh, filter in. I see we've got lots of folks coming in the, um, the broadcast right now, so we'll give them just a minute. Um, I am Kelly Bolter, the Adult Programming Coordinator, and joining me tonight is Librarian Beth from East Branch. So we'll be uh, monitoring the chat and the Q&A during the session. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat and um, questions from Linda can go in the Q&A. We will answer those at the end of the program this evening. And yes, everyone should be muted as they're coming in the event. So just give folks uh, another minute here and then we'll get started with Melinda. So thanks for sitting tight. Okay, so why don't we get started? So um, good evening, everyone. Again, I am Kelly Bolter, the Adult Programming Coordinator at Milwaukee Public Library. Uh, we are very excited to welcome back Melinda Myers to talk about planting your rain garden this evening. Uh, joining us will be Librarian Beth from East Branch. Uh, Beth and I will be watching the chat and the Q&A while, uh, while Melinda uh, presents on the topic this evening. So um, feel free to uh, chat amongst yourselves in the, the chat box. Any questions for Melinda should go in the Q&A, which you should see a button on the bottom of your screen. We'll have time at the end of the presentation this evening to answer your questions. Um, and we look forward to learning more about planting our rain garden. So uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Melinda. Thanks, Kelly and Beth. And thanks, thanks to all of you for joining me. This is a great topic that I love to share with and I appreciate the fact that you are planting a rain garden and helping to keep water where it falls on your landscape. Good for our landscape, good for our environment. I always like to thank the sponsors of my webinar, Fresh Coast Guardians, people like you and me who care about our lakes and waterways with lots of great information to help you be a good steward of the environment and have a beautiful landscape. And Milwaukee Metro Sewage District as well. We always hear the bad things about them, but they're doing amazing things to really manage our st stormwater and improve water quality. And of course, Milwaukee Public Library for hosting this webinar. The library is near and dear to my heart. Um, I started my career speaking to parents of preschoolers who the kids were in the story hour and I teach gardening to them and their little babies. So uh, the library is where I really feel like I started my speaking gig. And so I wanna thank them for giving me that opportunity and continuing our relationship as well. So let's review your plan. So we talked about planning your egg garden. We talked about selecting your plants. Hopefully you were able to join me. If not, those uh, videos or the recordings are on the library's YouTube channel. So you can review those as well. It wouldn't hurt because, you know, it's been a while for, since we talked about those. The home garden, the guide for homeowners and landscapers, sorry for that, by Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, their rain garden guide is excellent. It takes you step by step through the process. And it's a good place to start, even if you've already purchased your plants and now you're trying to figure out what to do with all of them. Take a look at that. It's free. You can download it. You, there's a link on the Fresh Coast Guardians website and in your handout as well. And the handout has lots of information that follows along with this webinar, but also some links to other resources. Because my goal is once we're finished chatting here tonight, that you have the opportunity to get more information and answers to questions that maybe you didn't think of while we were talking. So here, let's talk about location. In case you haven't picked the spot, or maybe you have, let's make sure it's the right location for a rain garden. It should preferably be 10 feet, at least six feet away from the foundation of your house. You don't wanna have any more water near your basement. That's the last thing you need. No more than 30 feet. The further away the rain garden from your house, the more water that 
is picked up going across the lawn that's going to have to be dealt with in the rain garden. So that means a bigger rain garden. And you may want to do several small ones, one off of each downspout. And I'd suggest starting with one, first of all, as opposed to one huge rain garden. Um, I, if you're like me, I always have great plants in the spring and then it's time to plant and that's always fun. But boy, when it's time to weed, it seems like you're out there by yourself. So you want to make sure your garden is something you can manage. So you can see here where they place the rain garden. They're running the downspout or directing the water to the widest part of the rain garden whenever possible and as close to the center as you can do. This was a rain garden we installed, uh, I think it was in 2019. And one of the things you wanna do besides locating away from the foundation is keep it as far away from your lateral as possible. This is the water line that takes the water from your house out to the city storm sewer. So um, you wanna make sure that you keep it out of your rain garden out of the way because the rain garden, you're gonna be collecting water. And the last thing you want is more water by that lateral in case there's any leaks or any kind of cracks in it you don't want to add to that so we want to keep it several feet away further the better but in this case this was a small lot like many of you may be dealing with so she had to keep it a couple feet away but you can see she called the city had them come and mark that location so that water is going out to the city sewer system to be hauled away you know all of her gray water from the house oops if by chance you have a septic and a well, so maybe you're not in the city per se, you wanna keep your rain garden away from those as well. Don't need any additional water for your septic system. And we wanna make sure that water going in the ground is away from, as far away from the well as possible. So five feet from your septic, eight feet from the well minimum. Now, this is a gardener that had some very ambitious plans. I want to thank the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources for letting me use many of their pictures in this and the videos we've done. But this family directed their water off the roof to one rain garden. You can see those two downspouts. And what you can't see is they're taking most of the water from the roof of this house and directing it there. You can collect um, 623 gallons of water from a thousand square foot of roof in a one inch rain. That's about 62, 63 gallons of water per square foot when we get an inch of rain. And that might help you kind of visualize how much water you're gonna have to manage. And that number is important when you use the guide from the Department of Natural Resource, because you're going to calculate the size of your rain garden based on how much water you're collecting off your roof, the type of soil, and the slope. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. I always like to give a shout out to Diggers Hotline. Always call 811 or file online at diggershotline.com. And they'll, it's a free service. They'll come out mark the location of any, they'll call their utilities to come out, mark the location of any underground utilities in your work area. So in that area, you're planning on putting your rain garden. It's free. You need to give them at least three business days notice. The other thing you want to do is um, call them or contact them because it can avoid injury and even death. You hit a gas line or electric line that means injury. Inconvenience, you hit the cable, no one in the neighborhood's gonna like you and certainly not your family. And you're gonna save money because if you hit an underground utility and you did not have them come out and market, you're responsible for the repair. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd rather spend that money on plants than repairing a cable line. So review your plan. So maybe you went to Fresh Coast Guardians and used one of their plans or found one online and you ordered the plants accordingly. This is a good time to see if you were able to get all the plants that were in the original plan. Maybe you have some substitutes you have to make. That's very common. When we design a garden, we don't always aren't always able to access the plants we want. So this is a chance to look at what you planned, make any substitutes as needed. And then as you're reviewing your location and your plan, are you going to have easy access to all parts of the garden, you know, for weeding, for mowing the grass, if you've kept grass around that area to get into all parts of the garden? When I lived in the city of Milwaukee, I had a small city lot, but I converted the whole front yard to garden and then realized I couldn't reach all parts of my garden. So I had to put some steppers in there so I could get in there to weed and take care of the garden. So make sure that 
that your rain garden is located so that you can manage the area around and within the garden. So here we are back at the location looking at before, here's her yard, decided to do this side of the yard. It was a little bit wider. She worked with her neighbor um, and it's a typical urban lot. And that was one of the reasons we decided to work with her to install the rain garden because we thought so many of you might have this situation. And if you don't, you're lucky, you got plenty of room for a rain garden. So here she is measuring off the start of the rain garden, looking at keeping it as far away from the foundation as possible. Again, we wanna keep it at least six preferably 10 feet away. And so we used a tape measure just to make sure we were at the right space, mark that backmost border of the garden. And then we laid out in this case, an extension cord. You could use an old hose, you could use an old extension cord, a rope, that works very well. And I like using something like this because I can adjust the design as I go. Oh, it doesn't quite look right. Or maybe I need to make this wider or I need to adjust the size a little bit over here. Once we have the final layout, um, I like to use marking tape. Um, some people use flour. I just find that the hose can move around a little bit as I'm doing my digging where marking that ground makes it a little easier to stay on target with the design. And uh, there have been times I've had to cross out some lines and readjust, but this is a great way to mark that location and then take a second look because if it doesn't look right, again, this is the time to adjust before you start digging. And that's what's next. Um, for smaller rain gardens, you may want to just use a shovel and just dig the edge up because we're going to remove that sod. Now, we had a lot of rain earlier in the season, but it's been very hot and dry recently. And if you're planning on digging up the sod, especially on your own, you may want to do a little bit of watering a few days prior if rain is not in the forecast, or even if it is and it doesn't happen, because moist soil is a lot easier to dig than dry, hard clay. And that's what I've had to do in a couple cases. So here, we started by hand, but honestly, we were doing a video of this, so I didn't have all day for us to dig. So we rented an edger, and they're available through places like Home Depot. I don't know about Menards and Lowe's, but uh, tool rental places as well. You may want to work with your neighbors. Let's say several of you are putting in gardens, hopefully several are doing rain gardens and maybe say, okay, this is the weekend we're going to do it. Let's rent a piece of equipment and then do your garden, the neighbor's garden and on down the line. And that way you share the cost. You don't have to store the equipment. You don't have to buy the equipment, but you get to use it when you need it and then take it back. And that might be a way to make the job easier for everyone. And even though this was a small garden, I had some great help. We had great help from a couple people from Fresh Coast Guardians. And uh, when we pulled out the edger and we pulled out the sod uh, cutter, which you'll see in a minute, they were like, oh, this is great because they've dug up many a garden by themselves. And I have too. And I'll tell you, this is a lot easier. So here was the garden. You could see she made the wide part near her home. You can kind of see that mark where she first measured, marked it out, and you can see she's edged around that whole garden bed. So now we're ready to remove the sod. And as I mentioned, you can do it by hand, and, and we did to show you how it could be done, but we only did a small section because it's a lot of work. Um, but that sod, we'll talk about in a minute, can be used in other places. Again, running a sod cutter, you set the depth, it cuts it up, you roll it up, and you can take it where you want. And that makes the job much quicker and easier. And I, I realize that equipment may or may not be in, in something that you're comfortable with, but I bet there's someone in your family, friendship, or neighborhood that would be willing to help. And maybe that's the trade-off. You rent the sod cutter, they help you do it, they get to use it. But it really made light of this work. We were able to remove this sod in no time at all and then get busy digging. But one of the things you want to do is make sure you're ready to manage that sod because there's going to be a lot of it when you remove it from the garden. Um, and it could be, if you have a nice lawn, it might be something you want to repurpose 
to fill in bare spaces. So if this was an area, you might want to clear out the weeds, prep the soil, and lay that sod in place to fill up those sparse or bare areas. And that way, you're not wasting good grass, so to speak. Maybe you're going to correct the grade by your foundation. We want to make sure that the soil slopes away from the foundation of the house so the water runs away from your basement, from the foundation of your house. You know, often over time, that soil sinks. Maybe you had some plants plantings you removed. And sometimes I find homes where the soil actually slopes into the foundation or your base into towards your house. And then you end up with water going that direction. So take advantage of this sod to change that grade if needed. Compost it green side down in this case, but add it to your compost pile or use it to start a compost pile. Um, throw on some fertilizer. I use malorganite, of course, some greens, uh, grass clippings, vegetable scraps, uh, worm castings, um, some browns, fall leaves, straw, things like that, and compost it. And it'll return into your garden beds as a wonderful soil amendment. I also used uh, sod I removed from areas to create raised beds. So the, this was a garden, uh, this was late winter, I think in 2019, I'd done some new beds. So we stacked the sod green side down, put malorganite over top the first layer, put another layer, malorganite over the top of that, and another layer and some malorganite. Then I covered it with clear plastic and I dug the beds in fall, covered them with clear plastic for winter because I wanted to speed the decomposition of those. By spring, I pulled off the plastic, was able to plant and had the best tomato harvest ever, actually two years in a row. So it was a great way to repurpose that material put it to use in my garden bed. You may want to share it with neighbors. If you don't have a use for it, you don't need to change the grade, you don't want to compost it, the grass is decent, you may want to share it with neighbors, but make sure you're not sharing anything unwanted like jumping worms. If you don't know what jumping worms are, that's probably a good thing because it means you probably don't have them. Jumping worms are not native. They um, sometimes are called crazy worms or snake worms because when you pick them up, they just kind of wiggle and squiggle. And even if you grab them, they'll break off their tail and keep going and continue to live. They overwinter as eggs and cocoons. So you don't always know you have them until maybe mid or late summer. They can reach eight inches in length and they eat an unbelievable amount of organic matter. And so it can really disrupt the soil chemistry and your soil texture. Um, they're still looking for ways to manage these worms. You can heat your compost up to 104 degrees from top to bottom, and that will kill the cocoons and the eggs. But you can't really do that to your sod without killing the sod, right? So if you're going to share it, make sure you're not passing along any jumping worms. That's really one of the main reasons, main ways they're spreading is by people sharing plants or sod or compost or soil. You've got to dig that. So we've gotten rid of the sod. Now it's time to dig the bed to a depth of four to eight inches. This is again where you're going to want to look at that DNR publication. There's a little bit of math involved, but it's fairly easy to follow. So again, depending on how much water you're trying to direct to this one rain garden, the type of soil you have, you can see this is heavy clay. So clay soil holds water longer. So you're going to need to dig deeper than if you had sandy, fast draining soils. Okay, so we're going to dig out that soil. And that means you're going to have some soil to deal with too. So just an example of what it looks like. This is from that DNR publication. And here they put the rain garden on a slope. We were lucky our rain garden was on flat that was a flat surface. But the steeper the slope, the more digging you're going to have to do. So you can see that they've marked the start of their rain garden 10 feet from the house. They've run a line across to the far side, use a level to make sure they want to, the end result needs to be a level rain guard, right? Because if it's on a slope, the water will run in and then out the other end. So we need it level. So you can see from this second area that they've dug out that area. So they're creating that pond. They're berming soil on the far end so that when water runs in, it collects in there and very little, if any, will flow out over the edge.
So deeper you dig, the more soil you have to deal with. So have a tarp handy or maybe some wheelbarrows. And this again is where you may wanna work with your neighbors or your gardening friends. I find most homeowners have one wheelbarrow. Make sure the tires um, inflated because it's gonna be heavy work. Or maybe you just throw down a tarp and shovel that soil into that. This was a different rain garden I did with another group of folks. And you can see a lot of debris. It was, it was um, pretty lousy soil actually. So we wanted to plan for how to deal with this. So repurposing, again, changing grade, maybe using it in your compost pile, maybe if you're creating lasagna gardens or hookah culture gardens, this may be part of it. Uh, maybe you add some compost to create some raised beds. And again, don't share it with others if you have jumping worms. Once we've dug that garden out, we're adding some compost. Compost is a great soil amendment. It increases drainage and heavy clay soils, increases water holding ability and sandy rocky soils. Uh, Fresh Coast Guardians often uses a planting mix, the it's topsoil with some organic matter mixed in. We wanna dig that into that top six to eight inches. We wanna create a healthy root zone. The better start we give our plants, the faster they'll get established and the sooner we have a thriving, healthy, beautiful rain garden. Um, once you've dug that, amended the soil, it's at the proper depth, you can rake some of that excess soil to create a berm at the far end. And this is that berm we saw earlier where when the rain garden fills up with water, if there's a lot of rain, this will either stop the overflow or slow the overflow so it doesn't rush over and out of the rain garden and into the storm sewer. Then we need to direct the water to the rain guard. And one way to do it is with a downspout and a downspout extension. And that's what we did here. Just dug a little bit of a trench to kind of nestle that downspout extension in place so that it wouldn't blow around and have it entering, <clears throat> excuse me, um, right at the start of the rain garden. So the water's coming from the roof, down the downspout, the extension into the rain garden. And you will be collecting some rain from the lawn as well. This was the project we did at this, um, it was an apartment complex and they wanted to install a rain garden. You can see we had a few challenges. One, the downspout was ripped off, so we had to reattach it. I think what happened is the mowing crew probably was annoyed by the downspout leading into the lawn and accidentally disconnected the downspout. Um, we had utilities, can you see those red lines? That was the electric electric utilities going through where we wanted to put our uh, rain garden downspout entrance and then a pretty large area. I wanted to keep it 10 feet away from the building. There were several buildings around this area. So we needed to put it in a place that made sense. And it was a slight slope going downhill. So how we manage this is we dug a trench and you could see we had to use pickaxes to get that trench going from the downspout to the rain garden. And then we had to slope it to make sure the water would go from the downspout into the rain garden. And then we used a flexible drain pipe and buried it in that area. And I'll show you that in a minute. At the end, well, let me actually go back just a second here. So what we did is we put the flexible drain spout pipe in there I was busy digging and I didn't get a picture of that, filled it with soil, then put the sod back on top of it so that one of the reasons we opted to go underground is we figured the mowing crew was more likely to mow over this if we made it easy. If they had to go around an above ground uh, da drained down, downspout extension, sorry, or if we put stone in there, it would just create a mess and a problem and it wouldn't be maintained. So we want to make it easy. And that's one thing you want to consider if it's in your yard, how do you make this job easy? So that's what we thought would work here. So once you get the water to the rain garden, you want to make sure that it doesn't erode the soil. So adding stones like we see here. So when that water is rushing down that downspout, the stones slow the velocity. So the water is moving much slower. So we're not eroding the soil. We're not washing out our new planting. Now, because we buried this flexible drain 
um, pipe, we put a rodent control at the end because the last thing we wanted to do is to have some animal crawl in and die, plug it up, and then we have to dig this up again, and that would be a mess. So covering that end was really important. We used stone on the slope going into the rain garden and some larger stone at the base, again, to control the erosion. Um, I have to tell you, all those bigger stones we dug up when we were digging that rain garden. So it was a little bit of work. Um, the other thing is, I talk about maintaining it. How do you make it easy to maintain your rain garden? Is it easy to mow around? And one of the things I showed you was burying the pipe that takes the water from the downspout to the garden. The other thing you might want to do is connect your rain garden to your traditional garden. So here she's got a foundation planting, but one option would be is to extend that foundation planting right to the edge of the rain garden. So you're planting normally, right? Because you're directing the water to the rain garden, not into that bed, but you're making it look like the garden goes from your house to the edge of the rain barrel that's a rain garden that's furthest from your home. So by doing that, you can have a beautiful garden from the foundation of your house out to the edge of your rain garden. So more space for planting, more space for some beautiful plants, and you don't need to mow around the back end. You don't have to worry about managing the grass or that area or where the downspout's going because you're going to have garden instead of grass. Okay, so maybe you ordered plants but you didn't have a design. And don't worry, you're not alone. A lot of people are in that boat. And so a couple things to do is check the tags. Hopefully you had some idea of the plants, the sunlight when you were ordering your plants, the moisture conditions they wanted. If you ordered your plants through Fresh Coast Guardians or from Milwaukee Metro Sewage District, those were all rain garden plants meant to be in the rain garden. But it's always good to check the tag. Find out what kind of spacing, how tall they're going to get. When are they going to bloom? Do they like it a little on the drier side or the moisture side? Moisture side, And then arrange it by height and bloom time. So what we did when we were doing this garden, the gardener picked some of her favorite plants, and I can relate. I'm a plant person, too. And so I went through her collection and kind of organized by here are your spring bloomers, here are the summer bloomers, here are the fall bloomers. So she could get an idea of how to have color throughout the season and how to manage it. And then which plants were going to be tall. So I kind of organize it so the tall ones, medium size, and short ones. So she could look at how to arrange and organize them based on height and bloom time, and then also moisture requirements. So the other thing to consider is moisture requirements that I mentioned. Some plants like well-drained to dry soils, like butterfly weed. It likes it hot and dry. So you want to keep this plant towards the edge. Think about how the water stays in your rain garden. It goes into the rain garden, sits in the bottom, in the middle, right? That's going to stay wet, wettest, longest, and the edges are going to dry out faster. So those plants that prefer dry conditions, for the most part, should go on those outer edges. Things that like it moist, Joe Pieweed, this is a tall plant, and it likes it moist. Swamp milkweed is another example of that. And the winged loosestrife, another example of plants that like it moist, and many of our sedges. So this might be the focal point in the garden in the center of the rain garden with shorter things going around it and those that like it dry along the edge of the garden. So we've kind of got an idea. Start setting your plants in place. Again, we're going to test our design. If you drew it out on paper, great. If you sketch something out or had an idea, once you organize those plants, set them in place, step back and take a look. Look at the texture, um, the bold leaves next to the fine texture, vertical interest, those long grass-like leaves, mixing it up a bit providing some unity, repeating some of the textures throughout is a great way to have unity and balance. And then a contrast of texture really makes each plant stand out. And then continue to adjust your design. It's okay. You know, I have plans in my head when I design a garden and then I always seem to fine tune and change things the last minute. Check the tags for spacing. Um, you'll notice when we, when I think I have a picture of the final planting on a couple different rain gardens, but 
I tend to plant close because these are smaller plants and you'll be dividing sooner, but you'll get bigger impact quicker. And so check that spacing. Prairie Nursery, which is located in Westfield, Wisconsin, um, does have great information on prairie plants. So if you can't find it on the tag, check Fresh Coast Guardian's website. And then Prairie Nursery does great profiles of those plants as well. So if you've never gardened before, or maybe if you're a little intimidated, here are some things to keep in mind. Um, when you're taking a plant out of the container, sometimes it's root bound and hard to get out. So I like to squeeze all the sides of the pot to kind of loosen that plant. I've even had to take a knife at times to cut away those that are really pot bound. Shouldn't be a problem with your rain garden plants. And then slide the plant out. Don't pull it by the stem because you can end up breaking the stem or pulling the roots or coming out with half the roots left in the pot and half attached. And you spent money, you want all the roots available. Then if the roots are growing in a circle or fill the pot, gently tease them apart. If you don't, they'll continue to grow in a circle and they won't explore the soil surrounding the root ball once you put them in the ground. If you're a new gardener, I know this can be a little difficult to do. I've had people say, yeah, I watch you gardeners and you horticulturists and you just kind of go <coughs> and kind of break those roots apart. Or some people will take, I have a weed knife and just slice through those roots in a couple places. And where those cuts are made, those roots will tend to go out and explore the surrounding soil. Plant it so that the crown of the plant, the place where the roots meet the stems, remains at the same location at the soil surface. Planting too deep can lead to root rot. Planting too shallow, the roots will be exposed, dry out, and the plant can die. So you want to make sure you keep it at the same level it was growing in the container. If you have help, um, there's nothing worse than planting yourself into the middle of the garden. I've seen when I've worked with groups and turned my back for a minute and all of a sudden there are three people stuck in the middle and they have to tiptoe out. So by starting in the middle, you can work your way out to the edge of the garden. It's a lot easier to do and it's easier to adjust as you go. And sometimes I like to plant, take a step back, take a look. Do I need to adjust anything as I'm making that final placement? easier to adjust before the plant goes in the ground. Water thoroughly. You want to remove any air pockets so that you good, have good root to soil connection. You're going to water thoroughly. Check your plants every couple of days. Typically, established plants need an inch of water a week, but that depends on the soil and that depends on the temperature. We've had some pretty hot days lately and we had a lot of rain early, but we haven't had a lot of rain recently. So check the soil moisture. I find my fingers the best moisture meter. So dig down four to six inches and it should be crumbly and slightly moist. That first few weeks, you're gonna check your plants every couple of days. If it's starting to dry near the base of the plant, water thoroughly. That root ball may be growing in soilless mix and dry out faster than the surrounding soil. So you may be spot watering initially, then gradually extend the time. Let's say you were watering every three days, go to every four or five days, and eventually a good soaking once a week. And then you're going to continue this through the first two years. It takes perennials two years to truly get established. But once your rain garden is established, you'll only be watering during extended dry periods. Leave the tag and snap a picture. This was some great advice I got when we were installing that rain garden from the folks at Fresh Coast Guardians. And it makes total sense. You know, you, you're sure you could identify that plant. Once it blooms, there's no problem. But the first year or two, this may be all you see. And in spring, when things are sprouting, I know people are going, is it a weed or is it a plant that I keep? Do I keep this one or pull it out? Believe me, I know because I get the baggies every spring and summer. Is this a weed or is it a plant? And I've had that challenge as well. So leaving the tag in, intact until you get familiar with the plants, a good starting point, taking pictures if you don't want to leave it in the garden, because some people don't like the looks of a garden full of tags. And then also maybe take a picture of the whole garden so you have an idea of the layout and making a sketch isn't a bad idea. 
mulching. Mulching helps suppress weeds, it conserves moisture, and as organic mulches break down, they continue to improve the soil and they help with erosion. I like twice shredded or triple shredded mulch that tends to knit together so it doesn't um, move under the force of water or on slopes as easily as some of the other mulches. And you want to just need a, a layer, the coarser the mulch, the thicker the layer can be, a couple inches if it's wood. If you're using, you know, evergreen needles, you only need an inch or less, same with any other fine material. When you're selecting your mulch, you want to keep in mind diseases, allelopathic, you know, black walnut um, mulch can be toxic to certain plants. So the last thing you want to do is kill the plants that you put in your garden. Uh, you don't want jumping worms. You don't want diseases like verticillium wilt. So if you're buying bag mulch, look for that certified product signed by the Mulch and Soil Council. If you're buying it in bulk like this, talk to your supplier. What are they doing to manage the mulch to make sure you're not going to end up with problems, jumping worm, diseases? Um, any of those things. And if they go, huh, then you probably want to buy your mulch somewhere else. And then for the berm, we're going to want to mulch it or plant it. Remember, this is going to get the force of water. This comes into play when there's too much water for your rain garden to handle in a heavy rainstorm. So there's going to be water rushing towards this and possibly over top. So the mulch will help prevent erosion. Plants are even better. You know, you could do something low growing like um, maybe prairie smoke, which makes a nice ground cover or the wild Tunia, which is really ru Ruella, and it's got blue flowers, spreads well, and it helps hold that soil in place. So looking for something that can anchor that and tolerate the drier conditions on those berms. Okay, weeding. Nobody likes to do, well, I shouldn't say nobody likes to do it. A lot of people find it great therapy, especially if you can keep up with it. And that's the key. Keep up with weeding. So if you start out the season determined to keep up with the weeding, it's a lot easier to do. Early morning, evenings, the mosquitoes are out. Dawn, dawn and dusk, the mosquitoes are out, but the temperatures are cooler. Maybe you have an umbrella. These last couple of days reminded me how brutal it can be weeding in the middle of the summer. But if you get the weeds sooner rather than later before they flower and set seed, you'll have hundreds fewer for next year to pull out of the garden. I like to keep a bucket with a weed knife. That's my favorite weeding tool, a pair of gloves and kneeler at my door. So I need a break. 10, 15 minutes, I go out to the garden in front of my house and I can pull some weeds. And so in 10 or 15 minutes, I don't get the whole bed taken care of, but I make a dent. And if I do that every time I have 10 minutes free, that garden can be managed relatively easy. And so keep that in mind. If you make it convenient, it's easier to do. And then be patient. Those little plants take a while to get to full size blooming beauty. There's an old saying on perennial gardens, the first year they sleep, the second year they creep, the third year they leap. And I know many, many of us, when we put in a garden are anxious for lots of beautiful blooms. And year one, we may not see them. And year two, they may just be starting to show up. And year three is when they really really put on a good show. So you do need to be patient. Those little plants and often put fairly close together are going to take a couple of years to get established and really put on a good display. If you want quicker results, buy bigger plants. Um, a gallon size perennial is going to come into maturity and bloom much quicker than a quart size or a four inch pot. Now this isn't a rain garden. I um, This is out on my property and I put in this large, with the help of my son-in-law, a large garden um, that was kind of a no maintenance, a mix of mostly native plants and a few cultivated plants. And I started, as you can see, with a lot of gallon size container plants because I wanted to get this garden looking good. I also had some smaller quart and four inch size plants too. Um, but I wanted to get that main garden looking good. Now that was in the fall of 2019. 
I think 2020 COVID hit and I don't know, I think I was busy doing webinars or something. I didn't, couldn't find any pictures, but this was the summer of 2021. So it had one growing season pass. This is Anna's hips, hyssop. And boy, what you can't see are all the bees. You can see some of the silver spotted skippers on there, but these plants huge. You can see some alliums blooming. Um, here's my rattlesnake master. Yes, there are some areas that I need to either fill in or wait for those plants to take off, but I had a good show. And by fall, here's what the garden looked like. Yes, I had space, but look at the color and the texture in this garden compared to that first fall of 2019. So in two years, pretty good show. It's not completely full and I'm still adding plants here and there. Something dies or it's not working. But again, bigger plants, sooner, quicker show. But I know some of you opt for short-term instant color because I see rain gardens with marigolds and zinnias and lots of annuals in them. So if you decide for this short-term, you want to match the plants you select to the moisture conditions in your rain garden. So that zinnia I showed you and this celosia or coxcomb are very heat and drought tolerant. So these would do best on the edges of your rain garden. Last year, they'd have done well anywhere because it was so hot and dry, but you wanna avoid the center that stays wet. So match the annual to those conditions if that's the route you decide to go. Cleome, Cleome is a nice big plant. It's gonna fill a lot of space for you the first year or so. And um, it's an annual, so you have to replace it every year. It does reseed, so you might get some seedlings popping up and it is tolerant of moisture soil conditions. So this could be something you could put in the center area, those west wetter portions of your rain garden. So you've got your garden through the summer, fall is here. You've kept the weeds under control, you've kept it watered, things are looking good. And our fall gardens are so important for our pollinators. So even if yours aren't blooming this year, uh, this fall, they will be in the future to help the pollinators. Continue to water as needed. You know, last year was pretty dry. The weather is crazy these days. So monitor the rainfall. You know, it can be very spotty and sporadic. When I worked for Extension, I was at an office in Wauwatosa. I did a lot of work with the Botanic Garden, which was in... Hales Corners, and I lived in Milwaukee on 16th Street. And we were having such spotty rainfall that when I would compare notes from my backyard, the gardens at the extension office and talk to the folks at Burner, it was very different rainfall. So a rain gauge, very cheap, make one, buy one. You can track how much water. Again, most gardens uh, need about an inch of water a week, maybe a little less when it's cooler and your soil's heavy, a little more if you have fast draining soils and the temperatures are high. Leave healthy plants stand for winter. It increases hardiness. You've got all this beautiful texture for winter interest. We are in the north, so this is our idea of winter interest. Those seed heads, the grasses moving in the wind, adding motion to the landscape. Anise hiss up here. The birds love these seeds. And so not only are you enjoying the beauty, but songbirds are going to come and feed on the seeds, adding color and motion to your landscape in winter. And I don't know about you, but if it wasn't for the songbirds, these Wisconsin winters can be pretty long and gray. They also provide homes for many beneficial insects. Many of our native bees nest in the hollow stems, a purple cone flower, anise hyssop, and some of the other plants. So leaving them stand provides homes for those beneficial insects. Do not pile snow and do not use de-icing salts in your rain garden. This is my sidewalk in front of my house in Milwaukee. And I always had snow from the street shoved up onto my tree border and the ice coming down from the hill. So always being careful where you place that snow. Try to avoid putting it in the rain garden. No more pressure on that garden than necessary. So if we plan and plant for success, we're gonna minimize maintenance and we're gonna increase the success of our rain garden. And so taking a little time as you do your planting, thinking through the ongoing maintenance, how are you gonna take care of those plants, arrange them for the beauty, but also for ease of care, you'll do much better. 
and enjoy your rain garden. Again, remember the first year, those differences are going to be subtle. You may not have any blooms, but you'll have lots of leaves and that promise for the future. Year two, you're going to see a lot of improvement, more flowers, more beauty. Year three, it's going to be full and looking great like this. And thanks to all of you for deciding to install a rain garden and making a difference protecting our lakes and waterways, keeping water on your landscape so it doesn't overflow our storm sewers and cause problems with water quality. It's going to save money because it'll be less money spent improving that storm water and treating it into drinking water, it's going to reduce the problems with managing it, and you're going to have a healthier landscape because you're using water where it falls. On your handout are links to all my social media. Um, if you've posted questions, hopefully you can ask them tonight so I can answer them in person. But if you think of some later, just be patient. I'm outnumbered, but I'll get to them. And please follow us. We try to do a Facebook daily post. We do some Pinterest, Twitter, and some YouTube videos. And last but not least, help me grow gardeners. Someone inspired you. And if this is your first year gardening, welcome. It's a wonderful community. If you've been gardening for years, share your expertise, inspire others, whether it's a youngster in your life or family, a young couple down the street, maybe help your neighbor start a rain garden as well, or a new retiree that finally has time to garden. My goal is to grow a kinder and gentler world, one garden and gardener at a time, and I'm going to need your help to do just that. I again want to thank Fresh Coast Guardians and MMSD for sponsoring this webinar. Um, we all have a stake in keeping water quality, improving our water quality, making sure we have drinking water now and in the future. And Fresh Coast Guardians is just a, a group of people like you and me that are concerned about keeping water, oops, sorry, and I spastic clicker here, keeping it and making a difference. So visit their website, Fresh Coast freshcoastguardians.com. There's links on your handout and tell them why, why you're making a difference with water quality. I'm going to turn it back over to my friends at the library who will help us go through answering questions, um, addressing any of your concerns in the chat. And uh, if you have other gardening questions, we'll take care of those as well. Thank you so much, Melinda. Um, it's so great to round out this series. I know we've, we've hosted a few workshops with you, like from start to finish with planting um, a rain garden and, and conceptualizing it. So I hope um, the folks here uh, tonight have been able to enjoy those previous um, sessions as well. So we do have some questions in the chat. Okay. Um, yeah. And so um, if you're um, if you're thinking of questions, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A for us to answer as well. So uh, we've got two questions from Angeline. Um, is malorganite safe to use on vegetable gardens? Yes, I'm glad you asked about that. Malorganite is the byproduct of our wastewater treatment. They test daily and weekly. So they check for heavy metals, not an issue. It's basically pathogen free. Um, they export it into Canada and it has to be pathogen free to do that. It's basically the microorganisms that digest the solids and then they're kiln dry. Um, they, the PFAS issue came up last year, I think it was, or the year before, maybe it was 2019. Those are those forever chemicals that are in cosmetics and food and water. And so obviously it ends up in our wastewater and that it is also in malorganite. However, they've monitored it and they're way below the federal standards. They're below the standards in Maine, uh, the state of Maine, which has the strictest PFAS regulations. They, like other sewage um, departments, uh, are working with legislators to try to get the PFAS whenever possible out of products if it's not necessary, because they don't want to have to deal with it on their end. Um, I choose to use malorganite on everything. It's labeled for use on edibles, ornamentals, it can be used in your rain garden. I incorporate it in my gardens at planting. It has 85% organic matter. But we garden because we want to control the inputs. And so if you're not comfortable, then don't use it on your edible plants. It's safe to use, but you know, it's a personal decision. So thank you for asking that question. 
And related to that, um, is there a period of time that needs to pass between fertilizing with morganite and consuming um, your, um, your plants, your edibles? No, good question. So a lot of times um, what is in the soil isn't, everything isn't taken up by our plants. And so there isn't a waiting period um, between application and eating. Uh, we see that a lot with pesticides, certain chemicals we apply to plants that we either can't eat them. So always read and follow label directions, or there's a period of time to wait between application and harvest. So there isn't with malorganite. But the real key is, when do you need to fertilize? So the reason I like malorganite, it's low nitrogen, slow release. I apply it to the soil at the start of the season if I'm doing vegetables or annual flower beds. Um, when I was in the city, I had amended my soil and I didn't need to fertilize very often. I'm in sandy soil now. And so I'm building my soil gradually, lots of organic mulches, adding some compost, doing lasagna gardening, but I need to fertilize more often because sand does not hold the nutrients. So I fertilize at the start of the season, if need be. And I let my plants tell me, do they need a little nutrient boost because they're not growing as well as they should be or not producing as much? Six to eight weeks later is the time to do a second application. So, you know, for tomatoes, you're probably applying it Oh, maybe July, mid-July is your second application, if need be, and you're harvesting, if we're lucky, in early August, depending on the, the year, the temperature and the weather. So yes, it's safe. It's slow release, so you're not going to damage those young plantings. With the rain garden, and I didn't mention fertilization, but um, depending on your soil, if you're adding compost, I usually add some malorganite at planting because it does have organic matter and it gets those plants off to a start, but it doesn't promote excessive top growth. It promotes balanced top and bottom growth. But that's probably the last time you're going to need to fertilize your rain garden. As long as you're leaving some plant debris on the ground, the native plants reach deep into the soil and pull up nutrients. And so they provide a lot of, and if you've got any members of the legume family like Baptisia or Lupine, they add nitrogen to the soil with their relationship with the soil bacteria. So minimal fertilizing after your garden is established for a rain garden, especially if you're in clay soil. It's a pain I know to deal with clay soil because it holds moisture so long, but it also holds on to nutrients. So it's more nutrient rich than say, fast draining, sandy, rocky soils. We've got two questions from Mark. Um, one follow-up to that, where can we buy malorganite? <laughs> If, if you're in the Milwaukee area, so on their website, malorganite.com, they do have a, a retail finder, um, if finder space, so it'll tell you places handling. I know Home Depot, I think Ace Hardware, though there's a lookalike that I think one of the big box stores is selling as, I think it's Ecolite or it's a different one. It's not Malorganite, but they kind of copied the bag. So if it doesn't say Malorganite, it's something else. Um, but they have a finder, retail finder on their website. Um, I know, and I would do some shopping. I buy my own Malorganite, even though I work with them, I do have to buy my own. So I wait for the sales. I usually stockpile it in my shed. So I have it when I need it. Um, so I do a little shopping. Some places do have truckload sales. Um, so you might want to check that. I give a call. If you're in the Milwaukee metro area, it hasn't been too much of a shortage. The further away from Milwaukee you get, there have been some shortages. So um, I would buy what you need to make sure you have it when you need it. As long as you keep a granular product dry, it, it lasts forever. So your fertilizer, if you keep it dry, it lasts forever. I'd keep it in a, a metal container with a, a locking lid. If you've got dogs that get into your shed, it won't hurt your dog, but it will give them the runs and who wants to clean that up and it will keep it dry um, or just in a dry shed or your garage out of the water. Liquids, on the other hand, can't be exposed to sunlight um, and they can't be exposed to freezing temperature that degrades them. And so if that happens, you know, you're not sure what the quantity or the quality of that fertilizer is. And so um, 
something to keep in mind. If your malorganite gets wet, I was talking to somebody, another a radio host, and we were talking about how to use it. I throw chunks in the compost pile because it doesn't matter. It'll eventually get work through the compost. Um, and that's one way because I don't want to use it in the garden because if some of those nutrients have washed out, I don't know how much fertilizer I'm putting down. So in the compost pile, I'm adding the organic matter and some nutrients as well. Long answer to a short question, sorry. Oh, no, that was very helpful. Um, and so Mark also would like to know what is lasagna gardening? Okay, so lasagna gardening is a method where, um, and Pat Lonza wrote the book, and the idea here is you're doing sort of a modified composting, building your raised bed. So picture you're gonna grow, make it a four by eight foot bed. That's kind of a traditional size. So I'd mark out the bed, put a layer of newspaper or cardboard down. Then I put eight to 10 inches of material that would go in the compost pile. So the outer leaves of a cabbage plant, those lettuce leaves that weren't quality enough to eat, you know, maybe they had too many holes in them. Um, grass clippings that haven't been treated with a weed killer. Some brown, those are nitrogen rich. I'd mix in some browns that are carbon rich. Um, that could be things like fall leaves. Those are high in carbon. It could be things like if you have some straw mulch that you aren't using or that decorative bales left, and you know, especially if you chop them up, mix those up, then top it with an inch of compost or a planting mix and some malorganite, then another eight to 10 inches of those green and browns until your, your bed is 18 to 24 inches high. You could do it in a raised bed form. Or what I do is I just created beds on top of my sandy soil because I'm, I don't have 25 years to fix my soil to make it as good as what I left in the city. And I planted right away. But you may want to build those lasagna beds in the fall that's when you got a lot of the raw materials and they'll settle over the winter and plant in the spring. I'll tell you, I planted that year, had some of the best peppers, sweet peppers, tomatoes and greens that I'd ever grown. And then I had fewer weeds the next couple of years compared to those gardens that were surrounding it. It's now level with the rest of my beds, but it's, I can still tell the gardens that I amended. And so I'm continuing to do this because I'm building my soil um, above ground uh, because adding organic matter is a great way to improve the soil, but it takes a lot of time. And I kind of felt like I needed to rush it. So that's one way to do it. I do have a video on my website, melindamyers.com on lasagna gardening. So you could check that out. The next step is hugel culture gardening where your first layer are big branches and um, fall leaves and then your lasagna garden on top of it. That's gonna last, give me more decades of benefits than the lasagna gardening. But it's a great method, it builds soil quickly and you don't have to buy so much topsoil. Fascinating. Thank you. Yeah. And again, that's um, her website is melindamyers.com. And we'll send a follow up email um, with Thank a link you. to this recording. And then, of course, a link to your website um, where uh, folks can find out um, more about lasagna gardening and, and other resources that you have posted there. Okay, let's see here. Veronica would like to know, where can I find information about soil amendments for typical Milwaukee clay soils? Um, okay, so probably you're, I'm going to go through sort of the basics. And then in terms of where to find them is probably going to be picking up the phone, checking online. So compost, you can make your own. And I've done um, a couple things I forgot to mention, I did a blog from a Lorganite on jumping worms. So go to their website. And if you do jumping worms, you'll get to the blog, a lot of detail, a lot of information. Uh, there's also some good information on that website on amending soil as well as mine. So compost, whether you make your own, and we, I did a video for them on making compost, um, or you can buy compost. Again, ask how they're managing that compost. Research is showing if the compost is heated to 104 degrees, but that means the whole pile has to reach that temperature and be processed in a way that can take care of a lot of the weeds, diseases, and jumping worms as well. So ask how, if you purchase compost, ask how they're managing it. So purple cow is one that you can find bagged in, it's not cow manure, it's um, landscape trimmings that have been composted. 
Uh, aged manure you often find at garden centers. That's an amendment that's not very nutrient rich. It's been composted and aged, so it adds organic matter, but not a lot of nutrients. Uh, peat moss is another one, uh, usually by, by the bale. Um, with peat moss, one of the concerns with peat moss is harvesting. I was lucky enough to go to the peat bogs in Canada. And in Canada, they really are very strict. When they open a bog to harvest the peat, the company has to put enough money aside to fix it when they're done. So they renovate it back to that original state. The government checks the runoff of the water separate from the company. The company monitors it too, but the government monitors it separately. So there's, you know, they make sure that there's not leachate going into the groundwater or the waterways, nearby waterways. Um, they could only go down a certain depth. One of the problems with the peat bogs in Europe is they used to be used for heating. And so they really harvested way down deep and destroyed them. And the other cool thing they did in Canada, they, they discovered that when they harvested that first layer to open the peat bog, they made a slurry of those plants and used that to inoculate peat bogs that were being renovated back to their original state. And they found they jump-started the growth of the plants that were typical for a peat bog. So that starting that, you know, rebuilding. So that's one option. Core, C-O-I-R, those are the husks of coconuts. Now there's some debate probably coming from the peat folks. That's, you know, it's not fair trade that these folks that are harvesting those and managing it aren't treated fairly. So that's one of the concerns there. Core I find holds moisture. Um, a long time. And for me, I haven't worked that into managing it well for me. Um, but a lot of gardeners love it because of that. Peat can be hydrophobic, meaning when it dries out, it's really dry and hard to rewet. That's why I really like compost the best for me. Um, and then if you are going to buy soil, get a blended planting mix. And that already has some topsoil and some compost or some other organic matter so that it's ready to use. And hopefully that helps. I'm not sure um, what the uh, University Extension Service has. Um, I would contact if you have a local garden center that you like working with. I would like I would check um, with them to see. Um, what kind of products they offer, do some price shopping and comparison. My understanding is freight costs have gone way up. So I think we're going to see a big increase in bulk material being trucked in and even bagged material. And then bag material may not be the most cost effective, but it might be the easiest to manage. When I lived in the city, I didn't have a driveway to dump compost. So bagged material, and I did my own composting, but I didn't have a lot of room. So bagged material might be the option just from a management standpoint versus buying in bulk. And if you buy in bulk, um, a yard of compost is a lot. Make sure you can manage it. Again, maybe you and your neighbors go in on it together to share the cost and to share the workload of getting it from the pile in your driveway into your garden and theirs. So hopefully that helps. Another question from Mark. Um, do you have a suggested ratio of compost to soil? Yes, good question. So usually, typically, you want to do at least an inch of compost for every inch amended. That's a lot of compost. So I usually kind of, if I could get two to four inches into the top eight to 12 inches of soil, that would be great because most people would be lucky to do that. But I was reading some research from a university that was suggesting that you do one for one and I'm like, oh, we're not going to do it. So I usually kind of go one to two um, and then work it in that way. So if you do two to four inches for the top eight to 12 inches of soil, you're going to get a good base for those plants and then follow up by using organic mulches on the soil surface. As those break down, those continue to improve the soil as well. So we've got a question from Tim about rain barrels. Um, so yes. I just want to tell everyone here we are hosting rain barrel workshops with Great. MMSD on um, May 19th and June 9th. So we'll include registration links in our follow-up email to those Excellent. as well. Um, Tim wanted to know um, where uh, we can buy rain barrels. Um, I'm just thinking like 
I know MMSD has been a source, but do you know, are there any other um, places or organizations that um, offer those as well? So one of the things, if you are in the Milwaukee Metro Sewage District, they are offering rain barrels that you can buy. They have the kits and they've got great videos on Fresh Coast Guardians on installation and, and installing them. Um, some garden centers sell them. I've noticed there are more garden centers offering them. Gardener Supply, if you haven't visited Gardener Supply, it's I call it the toy catalog for gardeners. They have cool stuff, but it's inspiration, even if you don't buy from them. But they offer a wide range of rain barrels. Um, if you're not in the Milwaukee Metro Sewage District, or you may want to contact your local municipality, because many of them want to promote harvesting rainwater to keep it out of the storm sewer, they may either offer some rebates or they may offer some rain barrels as well. Typically handled through the Department of Public Works, I would guess, or, um, you know, if you're in a town or a village, there's probably a clerk that you would start with and they direct you accordingly. Um, but those are some places. And even if you just do an internet search on rain barrels, you're going to find lots of different ones. Keep in mind a couple things. It should either have a cover so that it's got a mesh or a screen to keep out debris and insects and preferably mosquitoes, though a mosquito dunk popped into that rain barrel will work quite well. Or maybe the downspout goes right into that top and then otherwise it's solid. Uh, the MMSD rain barrels uh, are recommending using a downspout diverter. So you're putting that into the side and it has a solid top that you can either invert and use as a water garden or planter or put on the top so the water runs off. Um, so that's one thing. The spigot should be low on the barrel because you don't want water stagnating at the base. Um, and then you're going to want to elevate it up. And there'll be more of this in that rain barrel um, workshop. You'll get all the details you need. But if you're looking to buy one, uh, you should have an overflow at the top that you could either interconnect rain barrels because remember 623 gallons of water off a thousand square feet of roof in a one inch rain. That's a lot of rain. So you may want to have several rain barrels interlocking so they overflow into each other. If not, overflow away from the down, your downspout and the foundation. So that's where the downspout diverter, your rain barrel is full, it goes into your downspout. The overflow, if you don't use a diverter, pushes the water away from the foundation. There's another cool thing called the rain garden, but it's rain, one word, guard, G-U-A-R-D-E-N. And it was a, a engineer, she designed this kind of a rain barrel, rain garden. It's a raised bed, had, contains enough water for several different rain barrels would hold. And then a place for your downspout to go into a garden at the top. So it's a raised bed garden that collects water and the plants are rain garden plants. It's really cool. So if you do an internet search on rain garden, but spell it G-U-A-R-D-E-N, rain garden, um, you'll get to her website and see. It's very cool. I like that play on the, on the two words there. <laughs> yes. All right, so I see um, Sarah F. in the chat uh, shares Milwaukee Park and Rec is having a free rain barrel workshop in July, Excellent. and you can get a free barrel voucher at the end of it. So um, again, that's Milwaukee Park and Rec, and she says it's going to happen in July. So so yeah, if you um, follow up with them, I know they've got their, um, their offerings online. Um, that is another option as well. And thank you for sharing. That's what I love about gardeners, right, Kelly? And librarians. Yeah. <laughs> yeah always sharing, always sharing good news and Definitely. ideas with each other. So thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. All right. Does anyone have any other questions they'd like to ask this evening? Otherwise, uh, Melinda, is it okay if I offer um, your info email address for yes. this as well? So um, info at melindamyers.com. If you think of any questions later, um, you can feel free to email those to Melinda and I know she'll, she'll answer. She has time. Um, and, uh, and yeah, like I said, we will um, follow up this webinar with the handout um, from tonight and links to our future workshops and links to Melinda's website. 
um, and uh, also links to our previous workshops as well. We've got a Green Ideas playlist on the uh, Milwaukee Public Library YouTube channel now, so they're all collected in one place, which is really convenient. And if you missed our sustainable lawn and lands, I think it was called managing water on your property. I talked about rain barrels, rain guards, kind of all of the things that you could do, not all of them, but a good a variety of things gardeners can do to keep water out of our basement or at least reduce the risk and out of the storm sewers too. So that might be a good one if you missed it to check out to kind of get the overview of how does the rain garden and the rain barrel fit in the whole plan. So we've got lots of thanks from folks that have uh, tuned in tonight. Uh, B says, love the idea of bringing new gardeners along. Um, some find gardening intimidating. So, so yeah, it's nice to be able to, um, to guide young folks into, uh, into such a rewarding uh, thing. And uh, yeah, so lots of thanks. Well, thanks to all of you for tuning in this evening. Um, of course, many thanks to Melinda uh, for Always sharing her wisdom and, and um, also sharing your knowledge and um, answering our questions this evening. So uh, please uh, log on to mpl.org and we, we always post our upcoming events on there. Um, there is registration links for uh, our virtual workshops. Um, also keep an eye on our in-person events. We do have some coming up that we're very excited about. Um, so um, please uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, some of them do require registration as well, but of course everything is free. Um, all of our programs are free. So uh, we just like to get you know a head count to, to know how many people to expect. So um, again, that's mpl.org. And thanks to everyone for tuning in tonight. Thanks again to Melinda. Um, and we will uh, see you again soon. So have a great evening, everyone. Good night. Bye now.